I grew up in Westchester County, suburb of New York City. Um, my parents were both um, born and raised in Manhattan. Um, and I guess technically I was born in Manhattan, but when they had a family, they moved to the suburbs. Um, my father commuted to New York, but I was raised in the suburbs of New York. So uh, were you particularly scholarly when you were a child? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> My friends, I'm embarrassed to tell you, refer, during high school referred to me as no arm worth hammer because I, I, was, I never carried books home. Uh, I was a bum in high school. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, was, I really was. It was, uh, and, and I regret it. I mean, I, I mean, you know, my career's turned out fine, but who knows where I would have been. Uh, um, um, I did not. I mean, I, you know, I did well enough. I was smart enough to do well enough, but um, I did not work and hard in high school at all. And um, um, bowled a lot. Um, uh, what's, your best, what's your best bowling game? What's your best score? Um, 267. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, no, I was pretty good. And then I started playing bridge pretty seriously as I... Uh, teenager. My father was an expert bridge player and used to teach bridge. Uh, and so I started playing a lot of bridge as well. Well, that's, that takes a lot of brain power. Um, yeah, and it takes a lot of concentration. Um, and uh, then I gave it up for 35 years, actually, and then started playing about 12 years ago. So I still play now. So when, when did you start applying yourself to studies? Um, junior year in college. Was this got, at New York University? Was it was at NYU. Um, I got very serious, um, and then I was serious all throughout graduate school, and pretty serious, um, you know, once I started uh, teaching. And I'm sort of a, a bit of a rarity in that I was at, this, you know, I, I went to University of Vermont in 1968. When I um, went for my interview, which I guess would have been either in 67, winter of 67, 68, um, first time I'd ever been in the state, even though I grew up in New York. and. Uh, you know, while I was away on a couple of occasions, it was at the University of Vermont for my entire career, basically. So, um, when you first went to NYU, did you study political science from I the did. beginning? I did, I did. Um, but then I, it, it was in my jun, my junior year that I took my first course in political philosophy, and that was what turned me around. So what? What was it about that? It was a, I think. You know, like is often the case, um, it was the professor. I mean, it wasn't the stuff as much as it was the professor that got me excited about it. And uh, uh, now that was the old kind of political philosophy that um, where you studied the great books. You know, you studied Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and so forth. Um, I don't actually do that kind of political philosophy. I mean, I, I gave that, I mean, I still like it, but it wasn't what I found myself doing um, once I became a sort of reasonably serious scholar. So was there a moment in that first uh, philosophy class that you felt your brain sort of stretching and expanding or any particular aha moment or did it creep up on you? Um, well, first of all, general point. I'm 70 years old. Um, I've had chemotherapy. Who knows what's happened to my brain in terms of its memory? Uh, uh, so when you ask me about what happened, you know, 50 <laughs> years ago, uh, uh, I really can't tell you with any degree of uh, reliability. I doubt it was a single moment, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, you know, my wife says I can't remember anything, so. Uh, which is going to be a problem with a history project. <laughs> so, uh, okay. so what then can you tell me about the evolution from political science and uh, political philosophy to research ethics? How did that happen for you? Um, I was a political philosopher th throughout my entire uh, career. Um, I knew nothing about research ethics. Um, I didn't do bioethics. I didn't do research ethics. Um, it was, I retired from university in 2005, um, and I had known Zeke Emanuel, 
uh, who was chair of the bioethics department uh, at NIH um, since about 1989, um, when I was a fellow in the ethics program at Harvard. Um, and Zeke had started a um, visiting scholar program in the bioethics department at NIH, in which he was chair. And his idea was to bring people um, to, can to NIH for a year um, who typically didn't have any background in bioethics or research ethics, but he thought, you know, would be good people to have around and who would help, he used the expression, stir the pot. Mm -hmm. um, and I had worked on these concepts of coercion and exploitation. I did not know that these were big topics in research ethics. I mean, I had, didn't have the foggiest idea, because uh, it just wasn't what I did. Um, and, uh, but then I went down there and found that, yeah, actually stuff that I had been working on um, was of considerable importance in this other context that I knew nothing about. And so I was, um, I got involved, I, you know, during my year as a, it was just going to be a one-year gig. I was, the original intent was that I was going to, I re retired in 2005. This looked like something might be fun to do for a year. So I did it and I commuted from Vermont. I still live in Vermont. Um, and um, I was enjoying it. I guess they enjoyed having me around. I'm not quite sure what they got from it, but they seemed to enjoy having me around. Asked me to stay on. Uh, I said, all right, I'll do it for one more year. Um, um, I wasn't willing to commit at that point to doing more. Because again, I thought I was actually retiring. Uh, and, um, but one year turned to two, to three, and uh, I've been with them ever since. Um, um, around 2010, I, um, well, more accurately, I got, I got sick in 2009, um, had treatment, was doing okay, and continued to work more or less full-time uh, throughout 2009 and 10. But it became, I was going down every week from Vermont, that became too much. Uh, then I got sick again, and so starting around 2010, I've now been half time mm -hmm. with NIH. So I, I have a wonderful job. I mean, I have uh, I mostly telecommute, and I go down to the test about once every three or four weeks. Sometimes milestones in our youth take unexpected meaning when we later choose what we do with our adult yeah, life. Yeah. Um, was there anything in particular about your childhood or your young adult life that you think prepared you for the kind of work you ended up doing? No. I don't think so, actually. Uh, I mean, obviously I had, uh, I must have had some inner capacity to do the kind of work that I do, but I don't think there was anything that pointed me in this direction. In fact, um, I'm a big believer in sort of a maxim of never underestimate the importance of randomness. I mean, things happen. Um, sometimes economists will talk about what they call path dependence. You know, an event happens and you find yourself going down a particular path, which then changes the entire course of your life. I mean, that's true with personal relationships, true with marriage, true with having children. Uh, um, what was true with me um, academically, actually, as well. Um, um, I've been working on concepts like coercion and exploitation for a very long time. And, um, but I didn't start out particularly interested in this. Um, I had been at one point um, working on some issues in the philosophy of punishment, and I was interested in certain issues connected with plea bargaining. And uh, this was, now we're talking way, way back. We're talking in the 1970s now. Um, I read an article that was in a journal called Ethics, a uh, leading philosophy journal that was about, um, the article was called Criminal Justice and the Negotiated Plea. And the author of the article was saying that, you know, that plea bargaining, you know, where suppose a prosecutor says to somebody, um, okay, look, if you go to trial and you're convicted, you're probably going to get about 10 years. Um, I'll let you plead guilty to a lesser charge, and I'll recommend a one-year sentence if you plead guilty to that charge, your choice, 
Okay. And that's the way plea bargaining works. Um, and um, the author of this article was maintaining that he thought plea bargaining was coercive, that it was like the gunman holding uh, a gun to your head and saying, give me your money or your life, that the prosecutor was presenting you with that kind of choice, that plea bargains were therefore not voluntary, um, and that we shouldn't um, allow people, um, we shouldn't allow prosecutors to make those kinds of offers. Okay. And I just had the sense that that was wrong. Okay, that the view was wrong, that it wasn't coercive. Uh, and, but I didn't know why it was wrong. Um, and I knew, to be honest, I, I, I knew the author of the article, didn't particularly like him. <laughs> and, and so, and so um, I, 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 I decided I would try to figure out why, um, why he was wrong. And so actually I wrote a little article. Um, that appeared in Ethics as well it was a reply to this one called The Prosecutor and the Gunman. Um, and then that led to um, a longer article on the same issue, which, uh, and I was, um, and then that sort of morphed into um, this uh, book on coercion, which then morphed into work on exploitation. Um, and um, but if it hadn't been for that one article, who knows what I would have been doing? I mean, uh, actually, um, I mean, again, it's like getting, you know, you meet, you meet the person that becomes your wife, um, and, um, you know, your life takes a certain, you know, course. I mean, so um, I wasn't preparing for any of this. Uh, it, it happened. So, uh, but it sounds like there's some personality traits that you have that have, uh, that have been that you've used to be as successful as you have. So, you mean like not liking people and, 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 and writing? Being a confrontational, a little bit of a troublemaker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Inquisitive. Yeah, and yeah, actually, and, yeah, I don't see myself as particularly confrontational, but, but maybe I am, actually. And I mean, I, I've heard that I can, people have felt intimidated by me, and I, I certainly don't feel intimidating. Well, the topic, the very yeah, word, yeah, you know, yeah, and coercion, yeah, exploitation, yeah. Those, those are bell ringers. But many years ago, actually, um, it's a funny story, I, there was a fellow um, who was writing a, book. It ended up being called The Public Ivies. And it was about um, what he regarded as the best. This was an admission. He was an admissions professional. And it was about sort of the best, uh, uh, um, you know, public institutions. And he, University of Vermont was one that he was considering putting in the book. So he came up to the University of Vermont campus to, and he wanted to talk to people. I had just been chaired at a university-wide um, uh, committee on a, sort of a general curriculum project that had written this um, report, um, which was arguing for a certain kind of curriculum reform. In any case, I met with him, and I met uh, for breakfast, and along with the meeting was uh, a fellow from the College of Education, who was a kind of mild-mannered Clark Kent fellow, okay? And I think the contrast was a little too much for him. So in the public ivies, in the book, he talks about this breakfast with me and this other fellow, and he describes me as a, um, he said, uh, a rather aggressive political scientist who was the author of a brilliant report on undergraduate education. I met him a few years after that, uh, in different circumstances. You know, and I said, you made two mistakes in one sentence. I said, uh, I said I'm not that aggressive, and the report is not that brilliant. Uh, <laughs> um, but so um, maybe I'm more confrontational than I realize. Okay. What about this reputation as, as a bad boy? Or a, a, you, you present um, some ideas about You mean in the research ethics? In, or? The, research, in the research ethics. Relation. Yeah. Um, well, so I go to NIH, and you know I see that the department's interested in a number of issues, but research ethics is probably the dominant area of interest in the department. And and my background was in political philosophy, and I was sort of struck by um, the view that um, 
some, how do I want to put it, that there are some sorts of interactions that occur all the time in, in, in society and in life um, um, that involve, let's say, consent. So we consent to sexual relations. We consent to take on a mortgage. We, um, we, we agree to do all kinds of things. And that somehow in research, this was all like taken much more seriously and much more elaborately than, than we do in other areas of life. I mean, you know, just this morning, I went to sign on to the internet in the, uh, the hotel, and it says, you know, do you agree to these terms? And you check, what terms? You know, I mean, um, so I was, it was like, why, why, is, why are we so much more cautious in this field than we are in other areas of life? I mean, people get hurt with mortgages. People get hurt when they gamble. People get hurt when they have sexual relations. Uh, but we don't have anything like these sort of, we don't say before you can have sex, we have to, those have to go to independent review and we got to make sure that it's okay that you do this. Uh, um, we don't like, you have to have full information. Uh, no, people um, interact with each other without complete information all the time. And, and so I was um, struck by the view that research was special in this way and a bit skeptical as to whether it was as special as people in research ethics field think it is. I mean, to be honest, I've actually been a bit, because I'm still skeptical, um, I've always been a little bit puzzled as to why Primer has been um, interested in having me participate um, as much as I have, because I've actually... Um, been pretty involved with the organization for a while, but my views are um, sort of knocked down the center of Primer's commitment, I think. So um, the party line, so to speak, would be that subjects can be vulnerable and scientists know more than them and therefore have a greater responsibility to assure the safety and protection of the subject. I think there's, I think there's something to that, that there's asymmetrical knowledge and information, and when um, there's vastly asymmetrical knowledge um, uh, or information. We sometimes are more cautious. Um, uh, but um, I'm actually inclined to think uh, that um, the whole subject protection enterprise has got maybe a little too protectionist. So my thought is, is it, is it reactionary, this idea of protecting subjects based on the very scandalous and public? I think, and there, I, I think that's, that's large. I think it's a couple of things. One is it, it clearly is a reaction to, to the major scandals, um, Tuskegee, Nuremberg, Willowbrook, Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital case, and so forth. Um, so that's clearly a, a major part of it. I think a uh, second part, this would be true in the biomedical field, not true in the social and behavioral field, is um, the kind of merging of the clinical care context and the research context, applying to research relationships something like the physician-patient relationship um, in medical care, although I think actually that's not the way to go. Uh, I think some people have than those two together more than each other. Um, but then you have the whole extension of the model into um, social and behavioral research. Um, um, and I, I think, you know, it's like once an enterprise gets going, um, it gets sort of hard to stop. I mean, the train's left the station and the train's going, and you don't stop trains very easily, I think. Um, how much uh, abusive research the um, whole enterprise of subject protection, independent review, IRB, how much abusive research is actually being prevented by the system? And I think the answer is that we don't know. I think it may be impossible to know. Um, I mean, it's a bit like um, military defense. Um, how many attacks are we deterring out there? 
with our military capability. How many did we, you know, even when during the Cold War? What would have happened had, if we had had half the missiles that we had and, uh, and half the submarine? Who knows, right? I mean, would we have been attacked? I don't know. We, uh, um, it's, you know, when, when, would you, when your measure of success are the things that don't happen, uh, it's not what does happen, it's what doesn't happen. Um, you know, your measure is what's not happening that would have happened if we weren't doing this, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the question, it seems to me, for research. And it's very hard to get to, to know. I mean, you know, it could be like, my, you know, the magic effect of my ring, you know, keeping the elephants away, right? You see any elephants around? You know, it must be working. Uh, and and um, that would be crazy, right? I mean, so... See this IRB, this whole research subject protection enterprise? Do you see abusive research? No, there's actually relatively little. Well, so it must be working. Well, I mean, who knows? I think. Well, that's just a, that's a very frightening concept. <laughs> 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 uh, that we may be just uh, making ourselves feel better. Well, I think, um, I don't think that's frightening, actually. Um, um, I think part of what this whole system does Making feel better is one way to put it, but um, um, increasing societal trust in research, um, I think, is a better way of putting it, and I think that's perfectly legitimate. I mean, um, I think people are worried about it, um, um, and so if people are invited to participate in a trial, it gives them considerable comfort to know that it's been reviewed. Um, um, research depends upon public support, um, and and you know NIH is a lot of money, uh, and so public support for the entire enterprise of research is dependent on people's perceptions that it's um, proceeding in an ethical and careful way. Um, so. Um, it may not be as much about the protection of the subjects as, as it is about the importance of the perception that subjects are protected. But that's important. I mean, that's not, um, uh, not just a matter of making us feel better, I think. Uh, um, but I think that is, that is, that is part of it. Um, I, um, now, I think it's actually an interesting question, and I don't know that anybody's ever said it, as to why, I mean, when you think about the risks that people are willing to accept in life. Um, risks of driving, risks of employment. Uh, one of my favorite examples is lobster fishing, which turns out to be a very dangerous activity. Um, logging, structural steel work. Um, um, uh, people take, people who enter casinos and put their you know, financial well-being at risk. People take risks in life all the time. Um, and when bad things happen to these people, um, we just accept. You know, you know, that's just, well, you know, you do lobster fishing, you know, you're going to be able to get hurt. Um, logging, you know, structural steel work, building tunnels, um, you know, this is all dangerous stuff. And people die and get hurt. Um, and, but when people are hurt in research, we react very differently. I mean, you know, Jesse Gelsinger, you know, so he died. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know, this awful thing happened. A person died in 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 research, and actually, in that case, I think it was actually um, that death, in my view, shouldn't have happened. But um, but you know, I mean, people are hurt. And die all the time, and 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 yet we react in the research context very differently. I actually think it's an interesting question as to why people's reactions are um, so different. I'm not even saying that they shouldn't be different, but but I don't think we've asked this so much as to why it's different. Well, wouldn't it be because it's an artificial construct that 
I as a human and, and creator, or I as a scientist or researcher, I am creating a scenario where I am in control and supervising this situation where you are my subject and right, right. Must be, you are subject to the conditions and right. the procedures that I right. enact. Right. 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 That is much more a direct personal Yes. Role yes. than a logger who goes and does a dangerous thing in a forest. It's nature, or a person who walks into a casino and spends their money. Yeah. It's not another human being being put in control of their circumstances. Right. Well, yes and no. I mean, an employer offers you a job. Um, okay. um, an investigator offers you the opportunity to participate in research. Now, it's true that the investigator is actually often responsible for the actual intervention that results in the bad thing it's happening to you. Personal. It's and you, and you may have a person, you may, you might, right. Um, so, I mean, I think there are differences, and I think you've probably um, seized on uh, on a key difference. Uh, so actually, it's one that my colleague, one of my colleagues at NIH has written about, um, trying to explain. It's not that risk research is necessarily riskier than many of these other activities, but that it, the way the risk comes about yeah, exactly. is, 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 is different. How, how much moral weight we should give to that is another question, however. Uh, so, I mean, it, sometimes things have psychological weight without them having moral weight. Uh, um, I mean, uh, one of America's probably most famous ethicist, he's actually Australian, by the way, is Peter Singer who's a philosopher at Princeton. And Peter Singer, um, many years ago, wrote an uh, article um, um, Famine and Affluence. I don't quite remember the title of it now. But he starts out by saying, um, you know, if you walk by a pond and there's a little kid in it who's drowning. I mean, do you have an, uh, an obligation to pull that kid out of the pond? Where you can just a matter of getting your pants wet, um, you know, wading into the pond to pull the kid out. He says, "Of course you do." Okay. And Peter Singer says, "Well, you know, I can tell you right now that by you sending ten dollars to um, Oxfam or something like that, you can save somebody in Sub-Saharan Africa." Okay. Um, do you have the same obligation to do that? Most of us say, "No, no, that's different." Okay. And, and Peter Singer said, look, I know there's a psychological difference. This kid's right there in front of you. I mean, uh, the other person's on. He says, but should distance matter morally? You know, I mean, so, so something can be psychologically significant without it being morally significant, I think. So I think that's a question we have to raise. I mean, I, mean, I don't have to, you know, I don't regard myself as an opponent um, of any of this as much as I am a, a bit of a skeptic. I mean, I, I sort of want to sort of, add, I, I think some of it has been too easily accepted or too, and, and, and unquestioned. That's why Primer wants me around. Is we, we want someone asking these questions to. I don't know, do you? Well, I do. I don't know. <laughs> Joan clearly does. Uh, <laughs> so. uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I saw in a, in a talk I gave, I, I actually gave, it was a little bit dangerous to go there, but I did anyway. I mean, what, you know, I'm at the end of my career. What's the worst that can happen to me? <laughs> uh, uh, as I get fired. Uh, um, um, I talked about what I call the March of Dimes phenomenon. Um, uh, you know, the March of Dimes was originally founded to combat polio, right? Um, and it won, right? We conquered polio, at least in this country. Um, um, and so, of course, the, the organization accomplished what it set out to do, so it disbanded. No, it didn't disband. It found something else to do. I mean, because organizations have, once they're going, I mean, they have goals, they have capacities for fundraising, they have employees, they, I mean, there's a kind of organizational imperative to keep yourself going if you can. And so they found another legitimate activity, which was birth defects, right? So they switched from poet, they said, all right, we conquered one thing. Well, I mean, what if we really have prevented, we have sort of conquered, um, really abusive research. Uh, 
Um, you know, there aren't going to be any more Willowbrooks. Uh, there aren't going to be any more Tuskegee's. And and actually, I I actually think if you look back at almost all of the major scandals, um, almost all of them would not have happened if we had just one principle, and that was informed consent. Um, there was no consent in the Nazis. In Tuskegee, there was deception. I mean, the men consented to be part of something, but they didn't know what it was that they were part of. Um, the Jewish chronic disease hospitals case, these people consented to a skin test. They just didn't know what was actually being done to them. Um, um, you know, it, it's possible that, um, um, that much of what we've put into place to um, deter or prevent all of these abuses, um, it's, you know, I don't know. It, as I said, we're dealing with a counterfactual. Counterfactuals are hard. But we don't know how much of it is necessary. And, and I, I sometimes fear that organizations and, you know, that are committed to protection of subjects, uh, um, but the organization also has this is really dangerous now. I don't know that you're going to want this on a criminal oral history project. But, uh, I mean, criminal has its own interests. Um, um, you know, take the recent, um, I know I'm getting a dangerous territory here, but, um, you know, the federal government has now a uh, proposal on the books to change what's the common rule, right? AMPR. And one of the things that they want to change uh, concerns multi-site trials. Um, you know, right now, if there's a multi-site trial, it's got to get approved at every single site. Very costly, very time-consuming. Um, um, I think Primer is actually very resistant to the reduction, to, to um, consolidating trial review and the move to get rid of multi-site review. Um, and they may be right. I mean, it may be that um, there are good ethical reasons um, um, to resist it. But I think, you know, we all need to sort of step back from ourselves and say, do we have an interest in this game? You know, and, and is it possible that, I mean, look, Premier wants there to be more IRB members, not fewer. Uh, uh, and, and, and so um, I think Everybody in any enterprise, I mean, whatever we do, we need to sort of step back from what we're doing and, and, and ask whether um, we're seeing it clearly or whether we have our own interests. And I don't mean financial interests, uh, not a matter of money. I mean, it's, it's, but it's our commitments um, and our, our moral commitments that can sometimes, you know, I think lead us astray. So let me bring you back to a safer topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, is there such a thing as informed consent, truly informed consent? Um, well, it depends upon your model of informed consent. I prefer to refer to uh, valid consent. Can people give valid consent? And um, a colleague at NIH and I wrote a series of articles, actually, and then one of them became part of a chapter of my book. Um, um, we developed what we call the fair transaction model of consent, valid consent, and contrast it with something that we refer to as the autonomous authorization model. And, and um, the autonomous authorization model sort of says, well, you know, you'd have to be, you know, completely voluntary, whatever that means informed and so forth and 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 it's possible on the autonomous authorization model that it's very hard to get what's called you know what you might call you know, truly informed consent um, we believe the right way and we do the we we argue in the in these articles that the right way to think about the problem is not um, autonomous authorization but did the parties treat each other fairly? Did they have a fair opportunity to give consent? Um, and one way, we, we sort of backed into this by looking at other, again, it's sort of my 
my shtick, my, my way of approaching the questions is to say, all right, let's step back from research ethics for a minute and look at other areas of life. You go into a restaurant and the waitress, I'm sorry, server, waitress, waitress that says, uh, we have several specials tonight, um, and she tells you what the special is, and she doesn't tell you the price. And you say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. I'll have that. Okay. And then you find that it was actually more expensive than you thought it would be. Did you consent to pay the, the price? Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of a normal everyday transaction, right? We've all, we've all been there. Um, um, did you give informed consent to purchase it when you didn't know the price? Well, probably not. Um, did, were you obligated? Did you give valid consent? Well, maybe. You had the opportunity to ask her about the price if you wanted. Um, um, it could be, in this case, the responsibility was on you. Um, or we might just say, you know, look, this is an area of life where we don't think full disclosure is of everything is absolutely uh, necessary. So um, um, if people go into a casino and gamble and they're not told um, sort of what the house take is, um, you know, of the money bet at the roulette table. How much actually goes back to the better? Are they giving informed consent to when they when they say put their money down on black? Well, maybe not. Okay, uh, by the it's autonomous authorization. Are they being treated fairly? Um, that's another question. And and so we think that um, we argued there that. Um, um, this sort of autonomous authorization model, which we think has been dominant, and actually you find in the Belmont report, um, it's the wrong way to think about the problem. Uh, and, and the crucial issue is whether in getting consent, the parties have treated each other fairly. Now, what does that mean? What treating these people fairly involves differs from context to context. If I'm selling my home to you, I have obligations that I don't have um, if I'm selling my camera to you. Um, if I'm selling my home to you, um, in most states in this country, I have a legal, and in any case, I would think one has a moral obligation uh, to disclose defects about the house that I know of. Um, uh, if the roof leaks, if there's, if there's water in the basement, if there, you know, whatever it is that may not be directly observable. Um, um, I think I have an obligation to disclose. I mean, we're more rigorous in some contexts than we are in others, and I think appropriately. Okay, so we have to decide. Um, um, we're not. I mean, other areas of life. When I go to rent a car, and they give me this long form, uh, they don't expect me to read it. I don't read it. I, you know, I just sign. I mean, I don't have. A, I really, I don't. Have, I mean. But is that an okay transaction? Well, in that context, we might think, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so I think what we need to determine about consent in the research context is sort of what are people's sort of obligations to disclose? Um, um, and uh, how much is it fair to require people um, um, to know? I mean, in the medical, and, and here I think, by the way, there's, a, there's an actual important difference between the medical care context and the research context. I actually think the obligations are greater in the research context than in the care context. Uh, I'm a bit of a, I confess, I mean, I'm an academic, I'm involved with bioethics, but when it's my own care, I'm a minimalist about consent. Um, my doc says, I think this is what you ought to do. Okay. Um, that's enough. Um, I, don't, I don't ask for, I mean, if I asked, they would say, but um, um, uh, I don't necessarily want lots of information about you know, benefits and risks and alternatives. Um, now, in this case, we might say, well, I'm sort of waving my my right to give informed consent, as it were, but but um, in the research context, I mean, but in the in the care context, in a way that makes sense. Look, I assume my doctor is recommending what he or she believes is in my interest. It's not about what's in my head as to whether my consent is valid. 
Um, it's about whether I've been treated fairly in that context. Um, if they've given me the opportunity to get certain kind of information, but for one reason or another I choose not to get it or I don't pay attention, um, I think that's enough. Have I given informed consent if I don't understand what's happening? Well, in a certain sense, no. But I think my consent has been valid. I mean, if I've chosen, uh, they've given me a fair opportunity, and I've just said, I don't want to go there. So have you been a subject in a research study? Um, I have, actually. Well, for a while. I've actually written a little article. Because there's, having said that I'm a bit of a minimalist, there's a dimension of informed consent that, that occurred to me as a result of my own experience. Um, um, and so I'm actually adding an element, I'm, I'm now proposing in something I've written to add an element to informed consent, which nobody else has talked about. Uh, so this is what happened. Um, in 2008, completely incidental finding, normal annual physical, uh, my blood count, did normal blood work, came back with high white blood cell count. My Doctor, she said, "I think you. Um, we, we need to have more tests, um, and I think you need to see a hematologist." Um, so we did more tests, and there was a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, I was feeling fine at the time, um, completely incidental finding. And um, so I saw the the uh, hematologist, oncologist, and. Actually, about the first thing he did was to invite me to participate in a trial. And this was a trial for um, asymptomatic CLL patients who were at high risk for early symptoms. Because uh, many people can go for 15 years with CLL and never have symptoms. Um, and there were new genetic tests to determine who was at high risk. So if you entered the trial, first thing that happened was that you were asked to undergo this genetic test, basically just a blood draw. And if you were at low risk, um, then you know you were sort of put in one arm and, and uh, they would just watch and wait. If you were at high risk, um, you were going to be randomized. They didn't know at the time whether um, treating people who were at high risk before they had symptoms was better for them than waiting for the symptoms to appear. So this wasn't about a new drug. It was about the timing of the administration of the standard drugs that were available. And um, so they, he asked me to participate in this trial. To me, actually, the most difficult part of it was whether I wanted to know that I, whether I was at high risk. And I wasn't sure I wanted to know. But I said, OK. And, and by the way, I, one of the things I learned from this, I think one of the reasons people consent to participate in trials is um, they like the approval of their docs. I like my doc. I mean, I mean, I, I was curious about what it was like to be a research participant. Um, I also had written about people's obligation to participate in clinical trials, so I felt like it would be hypocritical to say no. Um, so I said yes. Turned out I was at high risk. Um, he was a little surprised, actually, but. I was, um, and I got randomized to the early treatment arm, the pre-symptom arm, and we were about to begin treatment. But my blood counts continued to go up, um, and so I was technically no longer, I was excluded from the trial at the, uh, before I started getting the uh, trial treatment. Um, and um, basically, I had pretty much the same treatment that I would have gotten on trial anyway although a less aggressive form of it, which actually is, is an issue there, which I've never confronted my doc about, but I'm going to let that go. Um, but here's, here's what led to my interest. Um, I mean, my, there was no prospect of direct benefit. They were in equipoise between whether early treatment was better. They didn't know. I had no reason to think I would be better off being in the trial than not being in the trial. If I wasn't in the trial, we would wait. and. Um, when treatment was indicated, I would get it. Um, but I got excluded from the trial. At, uh, yeah, I had the normal treatment. Um, and then my doc told me, you know, a, a year or two later, because um, I've now sort of had to go through this twice, um, 
the trial was shut down for lack of accrual of, so, of an adequate number of subjects. In fact, they didn't come close. I think they wanted something like 1,500 subjects, and they might have gotten 100. And so the accrual rate was so slow that they stopped the trial. And they might say, well, okay, what's the issue? Well, here's the issue that I thought was of some interest. If they had told me that there was a good chance that the trial would never complete, um, and, um, and that my participation would not have contributed to any generalizable knowledge, would I have chosen to participate? Maybe not. We don't, so now the issue that I've raised in this manuscript is whether we need to tell prospective subjects um, about the possibility that, they're, that the trial may never complete. Now, some kind of trials are very likely to complete. I mean, the, uh, this is a particular problem for oncology trials. In, in most commercial research, they complete. Um, uh, rate of completion in public research is a little bit lower. Um, but oncology is particularly low. It's very hard to recruit people. Uh, adult oncology, pediatric oncology is actually not so hard. So, um, so, so that's the issue I'm posing. Do they need, now of course, if you tell people about, the, every oncologist that I've asked says, no, we don't want to tell people that. It's going to make our problem even more difficult, um, which sounds right to me. It would make their problem more difficult, but that doesn't mean that prospective subjects shouldn't be informed. Uh, um, that opens a whole can of worms. Then how much about the study design should you inform the subjects? Or, or you know, suppose the trial had been going on for a year when, when, when my case came around. And um, should they said, you know, by the way, you should know that in a year we've gotten 50 people. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, I'm more sophisticated than the average person about these things. And I must say, the issue of non-completion never occurred to me. And it didn't occur to any of my colleagues either. And when I've asked my colleagues about it at NIH, um, no, nobody's ever talked about it. Now, did the research team, I mean, your doctor clearly, he knew who you were and what your background was. Yeah, yeah. How about the people who were going through the consent process with you? Was anybody extra nervous because of who you no. were? Your no, they didn't know. They didn't, they didn't know. And no. you weren't trying to be particularly detailed in your... No, no, oh, oh, no, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I actually did ask my, uh, well, Zeke Emanuel, who's an oncologist himself and who was my chair at the time uh, at NIH, uh, I had him look at the protocol and ask him whether he thought it was, he said yes. By the way, if, if he thought that this trial would never complete, that's not something he said to me. Uh, so uh, interesting, I have never thought of that either. Uh, and, and it, and here's the more general point. Um, most of the information that we worry about that's given to subjects concerns um, personal risks and benefits from participation. We're approaching the subject as a um, self-interested person. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's, will this be good for you? We don't think much about the information that uh, someone who's participating for altruistic reasons um, might need. Um, I mean, consider giving money to a charity. I mean, if, if it turns out that this charity, that one charity um, takes 50% of the money and uses it for, its fun, for more fundraising, it doesn't actually go to the, to the people that it's trying to serve. Um, and another charity actually is, gives 90% of its money, of the money that it raises. You know, this is information that we, we might want to know when we're deciding how to behave altruistically, what charities to give to. You know, it, you know we care about what charities we, we give to. Uh, we, do, do need inf we do need information, although interestingly, we don't require much information in that, in that context. We don't think much about the information that's necessary to make an intelligent altruistic decision. Suppose, for example, that if I hadn't enrolled in this trial, there might have been another trial 
that I couldn't enroll there. I can't be in both. Well, I might want to know. I might want to prefer, I, I would prefer to enroll in the trial where I'm going to actually make a difference. So, um, so let me ask you, um, you're a pretty sophisticated consumer with regards to being potentially considering to be part of a clinical trial, even though you say you weren't bringing any particular extra yeah. observational skills to that process. For yeah, yourself. yeah. What do you think the general person on the street, the average guy on the street, needs to know about research? I think um, basically two things. Um, what are the potential benefits from participating? I mean, could be medical. Could be other kinds of benefits. I mean, I, I, I've been on a bit of a campaign about payment and financial benefits, which I take more seriously than um, most people in the research ethics community. Um, um, and the other thing is the personal risks, the risks. Um, um, consider um, um, what's called the therapeutic misconception, where many people involved in research sort of they don't really understand that they're in research or they don't understand randomization. Um, even if it's been explained, even on even if on an intellectual level, they sort of understand. They think, well, my treatment that's going to be the one that Doc thinks is good for me, right? Okay. Um, is it important that they understand randomization? Is it important that it, I actually don't think so. I think what they need to know is um, what, in what ways, if any, are they likely to benefit, and in what ways, if any, is participation going to be risky to them and bad for them. I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, we need to sort of zero in on what, people don't need to understand everything, I think. Uh, I think there's actually been too much fuss over the therapeutic misconception. You know, if we were going to uh, expand the perspective a little bit to the whole world, yeah, yeah. what in, in general, what do you think of the human species, what do we need to know about research? What are, wow. That's I'd probably beyond my pay grade. Uh, to answer that question, uh, what, do we, what does the world need to know? Um, well, um, well, one of the things I think the world needs to know is um, that it's important. Um, I think most people don't think about it too much. Um, unless the time that people think about research I think is when um, when they have an illness or disease um, for which standard treatments aren't working very well, and then entry into a trial, a medical trial for them may be beneficial because of something new and different. Um, I was just recently at a conference on gastrointestinal cancer. Uh, Conference was concerned with how we how how are we going to recruit more patients to our to our, to, our, to, our, to our research, and that's what they were all talking about. Um, um, but that it's um, when research is done right, it's of cumulatively of great social value, and I say cumulatively because. You know, in most research, most even good research, it's not like it's some novel intervention that's going to cure some disease. That's not, that's not, you know, these things occur in small, small steps. The study that I was in for a bit, you know, it didn't concern a new drug or a new cure, but it, the timing of treatment is a very important clinical question. When is it best to give it to you? And you, you got, you got to find out. Um, 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 now, I should say that, I mean, one, there are many people in the bioethics community um, that perceive the Department of Bioethics at NIH as sort of hired guns for, for the NIH sort of to promote um, research-friendly ethics, as it were. I mean, the, 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 the department is more research-friendly than is um, the norm in bioethics. If you read the bioethics journals, there's you know 
very cautious, much more cautious about. Wait, this is, so this is actually this is the perception or the actual case that it is more. Research? Oh, I think it actually is the case that it's more research friendly. It is. It is the perception. I think it's also true. Actually, I think we're probably basically right as well. I mean, uh, um, well, you are uh, one of the hired guns. Uh, so, um, well, no, we're not hired guns. Actually, I, I think. It, um, I think it's because we're smart, and we, you know, smart people find out what's true, you know. Uh, but, 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 um, um, but it, no, it is, it is the case that we're, we're, in much of our work, we emphasize sort of, you know, the social value of, um, of, of research, and think that the social value of it is in some. Research ethics community is not taken sufficiently seriously. I have a paper um, recently uh, published um, um, whether, when doing risk benefit calculation, when IRBs do risk benefit assessment, um, whether they should include payment to research subjects as a benefit that could be used to offset the risk. So, if the research, if they say, look, this is risky. You know, and they're not paying these people, so the people aren't benefiting. Well, no, we, we can't approve it. The risks, the benefits don't outweigh the risks. But if they're paying them, and the IRB is considered payment as a benefit, well, okay, now we can only go through because they're, 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 okay. So, but it is absolutely black letter law in research ethics that you don't count payment as a benefit when you do risk benefit assessment, even though the subjects themselves obviously consider it a benefit. Um, well, I've actually argued that I think that's a mistake. I think it ought to be considered a benefit. Uh, now, um, I think almost all of my colleagues think I'm wrong about that. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me. I mean, um, I, I enjoy the conferences. Uh, everybody is so um, well-motivated and committed. Um, um, now, you know, I'm... I don't know much about sort of the nuts and bolts um, of doing um, review, research, IRBs, and kinds of things that people need to know. And a lot of what Quimmer does is um, oriented in that direction, um, as it should be. I mean, I mean, there. It's an educational organization. It's 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 not it's not an academic organization. It's very different, you know. Than when I go to these conferences, I mean, I'm a fact of I don't think of myself as talking to academic peers. I'm 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 in an educator um, educator role, and and so they they need to tell people what they need to know. Okay, that's. Um, but I think it also can and does. I think actually could do more to serve a kind of intellectual, push people intellectually a little bit more. And I think, I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons that they like me, because that's sort of what I do. Um, and um, um, I'm not, uh, you know, questioning some of the things that, that we may be uh, committed to. So I guess, you know, I've been on the core conference planning committee for a few years. I, I, I sort of think I'm the token academic curmudgeon, you know, who's pushing people in a particular uh, direction. Um, some of that's coming, come out in, um, uh, for example, choice of plenary speakers. I mean, the, the, the keynote speakers and the plenary speakers, um, um, I sort of, this is much too crude, much too simple, but there's a kind of division between let's call them the inspirational and the um, academic or the intellectual okay and and um, and inspirations important and good and I think the the organization and people love it I mean I've been able to I mean there are talks that have been given which I think oh that was a waste of time um, I didn't learn anything from that um, and you know I'm too old to be inspired at this point. So, so, but I could see that the audience was loving it, and it was doing for them what I think the organization wanted them to do, wanted to do, which was you know to inspire them. Um, I think sort of my role has been you know and sort of some of the um, plenary speakers that I've recommended. 
um, some of whom actually ended up um, uh, being chosen, some of which who have worked pretty well, some maybe not that much any people, although they have worked okay. Uh, like Jonathan Haidt last year was somebody I had crushed. Um, um, but I guess I see my role sort of pushing a little bit more in that direction, if that makes any sense. It does. Um, Let me say first, I mean, my um, some people pick relatively small topics to work on. Some people pick sort of big topics to work on. Um, my work, I mean, my topics are big enough, but they've all, they're also in a certain way pretty focused. What is coercion? What is exploitation? I mean, some people write about democracy and liberty and justice, and I don't do that sort of stuff. Uh, um, it's uh, I don't feel like I have anything to say about it. Um, that that would be interesting. I mean, you know, and and worth writing extensively about. It. And some of these things are just too tough. Uh, um, where do I think things are going? Um, Hard to say. I mean, I think um, to some extent, political philosophy tracks politics. Um, um, there was a time when people were, this was back um, um, when Democrats had been in power for a while. There was much more concern with equality and uh, justice. Uh, this was sort of like in the early 70s. Um, um, and people aren't writing as much about equality. I mean, it's like, you know, the politics has changed. Uh, um, it just seems equality is um, just, it's a political non-starter right now. I mean, uh, it's hard to get uh, the society agitated over the amount of inequality, which I think is morally unacceptable. Um, so it's a tendency to move to, to areas which the uh, political system is sort of more responsive to. So to some extent, where political philosophy is going to go, I think it's going to track where politics is going to go. And I don't have the foggiest idea uh, where, that's, where that's going. Um, and um, you know, again, I come back to path dependent. Um, probably the most important famous political philosopher of the 20th century uh, was John Rawls, uh, whose book, um, A Theory of Justice, um, spawned thousands and thousands of articles and probably hundreds of other books written about. And so you have a major development by maybe one person or a couple of people, which then, remember what I said about path dependence before, something happens and then that just shifts everything. Well, something may happen like that in political philosophy. Somebody may write the great book, uh, which is just very new and exciting and different, and then that just shifts the whole um, direction that people take, and they start working in, in that territory. and. Um, I guess one of the things about innovation is it's hard to predict what they're going to be. <laughs> um, that's why they're innovative. So, so you've only really been involved yourself with the research efforts portion since 2005, so that's right. roughly eight years. Can you imagine a danger ahead for research ethics or a pitfall that we may hmm. be likely to fall into? Or? Okay. Um, Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, I don't really do very well in real time, really thinking. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm serious. You know, some people are really quick on their feet, and and um, I tend to be a little slower on my feet. You've exploded my brain with everything uh, that we've talked about. Uh, now, so, uh, so, I'm, I'm so to um, it out. is there? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think there is any kind of. Uh, I don't see any kind of sort of catastrophic danger, you know, that's on the horizon. I mean, nothing like climate change, you know, or Hurricane Sandy or whatever. Um, um, but what I do worry about a bit is a kind of creeping um, expansionism of uh, protection that... Um, where we're just not 
we don't take sufficient into account how costly it is, uh, how much good research isn't happening, how much, uh, to what extent research proceeds slower than it ought to proceed, how many people are suffering because research is slowed down or because research is slowed down. I mean, that's another kind of counterfactual that we just don't, don't know. We don't know the good that's happening that's not happening because of the good that we're trying to do. Uh, um, um, so, you know, I guess I would just urge, you know, not any kind of radical change, but caution in that.